In Revelation 14, verse 6, we read of three messages that God is giving to the world to prepare them for His coming. These messages are especially important to us as Seventh-day Adventists because they characterize the work and the message that we're to give at the end of time. In fact, so important are they to us that we are told that nothing else is to be allowed to engross our attention or occupy our time. Why is this? Because it's God's purpose to raise up the ancient truths of the Bible of the primitive Christian church, the obedience to God's law, and the knowledge of righteousness by faith, and display that before the world in a peculiar people, a treasure, a depository of His truth. This is why it is so important that the Adventist people understand the history of the Sabbath-keeping church and be willing to hold the standard and the bannered high before the world. But in the last few generations, we've allowed our standards to be lowered. We're compromising with the world. This is now the time for laymen to take up the work, prayerfully go to our knees, and begin to fill in the vacuum of truth that is being left behind. The same woe that falls upon the unfaithful pastor will also fall upon the layman who does not take up the work. I'd like to show you something. This is Elmshaven, the home of Ellen White in Northern California. Here, she finally arrived in September 1900 after a stay in Australia. God settled her here because she had to face some of the greatest trials of her life. It was at this time that the church was embroiled in the alpha of apostasy. It was here that she had to send the councils to Loma Linda, California. Because of the standard dragging during the time that she was in this home, we had the burning of the largest sanitarium in the world, Battle Creek and also the burning of the Review and Herald offices. Literally, the church had to pick up and start all over again because of the mistakes that, she, that, that the church had made back then. We're making the same mistakes again today. Not far from here, in 1909, was established one of the colleges that was to put out missionaries all over the world, Pacific Union College in Angwin, California. That college was to continue and be one of the last institutions to close before the coming of Christ. This is the room where Ellen White did the last of her writing, and this is the room where she died. It was her great dream to see God's church go on to triumph. It was her dream to see the schools like Pacific Union College raise up young men and women to finish up the work, to raise the standard, and to give the loud cry to the world. I noticed on the stand beside her writing table this book, Great Controversy. It was here where the last edition of Great Controversy was made. And on page 61, we read of the Church of the Wilderness and the faith that our ancestors had in the Sabbath-keeping truth. Amid the gloom that settled upon the earth during the long period of papal supremacy, the light of truth could not be wholly extinguished in every age there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life and who hallowed the true Sabbath. How much the world owes to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics, their motives impugned, their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented or mutilated, yet they stood firm and from age to age maintained their faith in its purity as sacred heritage for the generations to come. The history of God's people during the ages of darkness that followed upon Rome's supremacy is written in heaven, but they have little place in human records. Few traces of their existence can be found except in the accusation of their persecutors. It was the policy of Rome to obliterate every trace of dissent from her doctrines or decrees. Everything heretical, whether persons or writings, was destroyed. We understand that the church at the end of time will rebuild the old waste places and the paths to dwell in. It's the work of our young people and our laymen and our ministry today to restore the old truths, 
to hold the old history up of the true Sabbath keeping before the world and show the true apostolic faith before the coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 12 gives us symbolism representing the history of God's church. The woman standing upon the moon symbolizes that God's church in all ages stands upon the holy decalogue, the Ten Commandment law, the reflection of the character of Jesus Christ. The woman is seen first pregnant representing the church of Israel of the Old Testament. Once the child is born in the story, it represents the Christian church. Notice that it is the same church. God's church in all ages observes the health laws and obedience to all God's command. The Sabbath becomes a special sign of that church. In the symbolism of the story of Revelation 12, we also see a great red dragon. That dragon represents all the powers and rulers and uh, efforts of Satan to destroy God's church on earth. This effort of destruction is symbolized as a dragon spewing water out of its mouth. That water represents the efforts of Satan to completely to destroy God's truth by destroying the truth through false doctrines, destroying the truth through changing history, and trying to physically destroy those in whom God dwells, those who obey God's commandments. There are many churches throughout the history of the Christian era where there was only one that could be called the church in the wilderness. The term wilderness represents obscurity, and for 1260 years, God's true church went into obscurity. It was hidden from the face of society. Today, history books rarely record anything of the other communes outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Thus, we know that the Roman Church could not be the true church of God, nor the Reformation Church. No, the primitive Christian Church of the Apostles, their teachings would make up the teachings of a church that is hidden from human view today. The ancient Israelites gained a tremendous boost for their religion when Daniel was honored by Nebuchadnezzar. The teachings of Daniel went throughout the world from that time, and the beliefs of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary system were accepted throughout many countries of the earth. We read in the records of Confucius, 500 years B.C., that in the capital of China, the merchants and the princes ceased their labors and closed their shops. Thus, we find as far away as China, the Sabbath was already being kept. Josephus could say in 70 A.D., as a result of the scattering of the Jews and the influence of Daniel, that there is not any city of the Grecians, nor any of the barbarians, nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day hath not come. The whole world appeared to have been aware of the Jewish faith. Outside the Roman Empire, where persecutions were taking place, we find that the Sabbath was accepted by the vast nations of the world because of the active trade routes that were uh, going from country to country and the Jewish merchants we find that that Christianity spread very rapidly among these Jews you see Jesus had told his disciples that their job was to go first to the loss of the house of Israel this meant that they would have to scatter throughout the earth and they would have to go to some of the most remote countries because the Jews were everywhere Peter became the apostle to Mesopotamia. We understand that in time he made his way to Baghdad or Babylon and there set up the great Assyrian church. This church kept the Sabbath very much like you and I do as Seventh-day Adventists. They left their fields and on the seventh day they went to the synagogue in the Judeo-Christian style. This was the true primitive Christian church they accepted the belief that through Christ they could obey all God's commandments and they taught the soon return of Jesus. They were Seventh-day Adventists. The hills of Persia and the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates River re-echoed their songs of praise. They reaped their harvests and paid their tithes. They repaired to their churches on the Sabbath day for the worship of God. What a wonderful thought that throughout the land that was once the center of paganism in the ancient world, we find the Sabbath day and the worship of Jesus Christ. The apostles went to many parts of the world. Thomas made his way down into India 
There he came in contact with the hardcore Brahmanism of Hinduism and the caste system. But he went there to find the loss of the House of Israel, which were established on the Malabar coast. Because of the tremendous influence of the St. Thomas Christian Church in India, we find that 600 years after the arrival of Thomas, the Brahmins woke up with a start. They saw that the Roman system had been able to create a tremendous counterfeit in the Roman Catholic Church. Wanting to duplicate that movement and regain power for themselves, they developed the legend of Krishna, which duplicated in many ways the story of Jesus Christ. Widespread and enduring was the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath among the believers of the Church of the East and the St. Thomas Christians of India who never were connected with Rome. It also was maintained among those bodies which broke off from Rome after the Council of Chalcedon, namely the Abyssinians, the Jacobites, the Maronites, and the Armenians. The Armenians were the first nation to fully accept Christianity, and they had kept the Sabbath all the way through the centuries. Abyssinia was in the northern part of Ethiopia, which can be seen on the right side of your map. They were in connection with the Coptic Church of Egypt. The Ethiopians were either Jewish already or they were pagans. When the disciples made their way down into Ethiopia, rapidly the Abyssinians accepted the teaching of the Sabbath and Christ. They had largely already been Jews, so they had the Sabbath, but they accepted Christ, and the country largely became Christian. In the last half of that century, St. Ambrose, this would be the 4th and 5th century, of Milan stated officially that the Abyssinian bishop Mucius had traveled almost everywhere in the country of Ceres. For more than 17 centuries, the Abyssinian church continued to sanctify Saturday as Holy Day of the Fourth Commandment. When we go to Abyssinia or Ethiopia today, the Amhara section of the country, we find there many churches, some like this one, completely carved out of solid stone, a holy place and a most holy place with a reflection of their honor of the early Hebrew sanctuary. Even to this day, the Sabbath is sacredly honored by these people and their priesthood. 3,500 years of Sabbath keeping. The bishop of the Abyssinian or Ethiopian church was designated for them by the Coptic Church of Alexandria, Egypt. This church also kept the seventh-day Sabbath. We find that from the land of Syria, the second center of missionary work after Jerusalem was destroyed, here where Paul had set up his work for the Gentile world, we find Syrian youth from the educational centers, missionary centers of that part of the world, making their way across the, the mountains, the valleys, and the deserts of the Orient. These people carried with them what was known as the Syrian Bible or the received text. This Bible had as wide a circulation in the East as the King James Bible had in the West. No one could stop these young men. They went into every country of the Orient. Syria hosted the highest form of education in the world. These Sabbath-keeping Jewish Christians in the land of Syria had established educational centers that were renowned everywhere. They were the leaders in the world of architects, uh, and when Justinian wanted to build a church in Constantinople, he had to send to Antioch for the architects to build one of the most beautiful cities with the largest dome that was ever known. When we look at the cities of the Middle East and see the towers, the archways, the domes, the parapets, the beautiful walls, the ability to fit stone together without mortar, we're seeing the work of the Sabbath-keeping Christians of Syria. When the Jewish Christians fled the Romans at the destruction of Jerusalem, first they went to the city of Pila. From there they continued their migration and their enriching of the cities of Syria all the way up into what is today Turkey and the southern part of old Armenia. There's over a hundred of these magnificent cities called the Silent Cities which lay barren and waste in the desert. No one lives there, and no tourist, very, or very rarely do tourists ever visit this, this ancient wonder. But as one looks at these ancient uh, cities, they see a form of architecture and sanitation that 
was and is superior to many of the buildings in Europe today. When the armies under the Roman Catholic Church forced their way into Constantinople, they were as if they were a bunch of barbarians barging into a world that was far in advance of their own. You see, these Sabbath keepers or Seventh-day Adventists that were the educators in the city of Antioch and Edessa and the Sibis, the great centers of education there, were the educators of the Saracens, the rulers of the Ottoman Empire. In the first great wave of Mohammedanism, they protected the Sabbath keepers and brought their educators and teachers with them. Thus, as they took over parts of Europe, they brought with them the high level of education of the Greek Sabbath keeping people, the Syrian church. These centers became the foundation of later centers in Europe of education, the foundation of Oxford and Cambridge. Very likely we owe the civilization of the Western world to the faithful Sabbath-keeping men of the past. One such man was a man by the name of Lucian. Lucian, in the third century, was responsible for pulling together the various books of the true Greek Bible, the Bible written by the apostles, and he formed what was called the Received Text. This Bible was translated into Syrian, it was translated into Latin, and it became the foundation of the Reformation and that it was the King James Bible translated later into German and to Dutch and to the various languages of Europe. That Bible is the Bible of the Sabbath-keeping Christians. It is the Seventh-day Adventist Bible. It is the finest manuscript of the Bible ever given and the purest manuscript today. The Syrian Christians, also called Nestorian Christians um, and Assyrian Christians, Church of the East, also made their way into Turkestan, Mongolia, and Scythia. We find that the Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, and other of the great Khans married into a line of church leaders, Sabbath-keeping church leaders called Prester John. They named themselves after the name of John. And when Marco Polo passed through Mongolia and other areas of the Orient, he found well-established Sabbath-keeping communities and churches throughout that realm. Evidently, Sabbath-keeping Christianity made its way early into China, and China became one of the largest homes of Sabbath-keeping Christianity. The capital of China in the ancient world was a place called Chang'an, today called Exian, China. Today, the, the greatest archaeological finds of China are in this old capital, cultural capital of China. In AD 781, a famous Chinese monument was inscribed in marble to tell of the growth of Christianity in China at that time. The inscription, consisting of 763 words, was unearthed in 1625 near the city of Chang'an and now stands in the Forest of Tablets, Chang'an. The following extract from the stone shows that the Sabbath was observed. On the seventh day we offer sacrifices after having purified our hearts and received absolution for our sins. This religion so perfect and so excellent is difficult to name, but it enlightens darkness by its precepts. There were a large number of Syrian words on that, and although the Jesuit priests and the Mandarins, which discovered the stone in 1625, tried to obliterate it, they didn't understand Syrian, and those words were left on the stone. Thus today we can read that the Sabbath-keeping Christians were the strongest religion in China at that time. Anything that happened in the capital of China was immediately duplicated in the land of Nippon or Japan. Buddhist priests from all over the Orient were studying in the capital there and there was an educational center of the Syrian church. Thus Buddhist priests came in contact with the Sabbath keeping truths and adopted the teaching of a redeemer and of a second coming. These teachings made their way to Japan especially through a great scholar by the name of Kuba Dayashi. He had studied in Chankon, China, and later when he was buried, he had a duplication of that monument stone found outside Chankon 
put o over his grave at the mausoleum of Kubadashi on Mount Koyo, Japan. Thus we know that the gospel spread all through the Orient. It went everywhere. Certainly the apostles in their time had laid a foundation for this, and Paul could say, before the destruction of Jerusalem, that we've preached the gospel to every creature under heaven. As rapidly as the gospel spread to the east, it also spread to the west. We find that very soon after Jesus ascended to heaven and, and filled his disciples with the Holy Spirit to send them out to the lost of the house of Israel, James made his way to the Jewish exiles in Spain. There he established the Spanish church, and later, after he died in 44 AD, his body was sent back to Spain, and it's to be found there today. Canon 26 of the Council of Elvira reveals that the Church of Spain at that time kept Saturday the seventh day as to fasting every Sabbath, resolved that the error be corrected of fasting every Sabbath. This resolution of the Council is in direct opposition to the policy of the Church of Rome had inaugurated that of commanding Sabbath as a fast day in order to humiliate it and to make it repugnant to the people. Even northeastern Europe early received the Sabbath. The patron saint of Russia is Andrew. Andrew and other disciples, five of them all together, made their way into Scythia, and there they established a magnificent Christian faith in Russia. Sabbath keeping was found all over Russia at one time. There around the Black Sea was another group of people called the Goths. The Goths were pagans. But in the 3rd century, or the 4th century, they captured a man by the name of Alphephus. Alphephus was a Sabbath-keeping Christian and a well-educated man. He wrote the first book for the Gothic people, which was the Bible, and the Goths, Ostrogoths and Visigoths, became Sabbath-keeping Christians. It is a fact that it was formerly the custom in the East to keep the Sabbath in the same manner as the Lord's Day and to hold sacred assemblies while on the on the other hand, the people of the West, contending for the Lord's Day, have neglected the celebration of the Sabbath. This is speaking of the Gothic king in A.D. 454 and 526. We know that the Vandals of Carthage were Sabbath-keeping Christians as well. Indeed, it appears that Sabbath-keeping had extended throughout the entire civilized world and that Rome and Alexandria, Egypt, were a minority in their keeping of Sunday. As you look at this map, you'll notice a place on the left side of the map called Galia. This is to what is called modern France today. These people, the Gaelic people extended into northern Spain and all the way across northern Europe. They were one of the largest families of antiquity. They were well established in the British Isles. The Gaelic people or the Celtic people were a race of powerful people that were very warlike and few nations could stand against them. They were also highly civilized and had advanced form of education. It was among these people that Paul uh, was directed by the Lord to begin his work of evangelism. At that time, he entered into um, missionary work among the Galatian people of Macedonia. It seems to have been custom very early in the Celtic churches of early times in Ireland as well as Scotland to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. One of the early, early Celts of Scotland was captured as a young man and taken to pagan Ireland. Later, upon escaping, he determined to go back and evangelize the people who had been his captors. He made his way directly to Tara, the capital of Ireland. Standing up in the center of that great city, he began to preach the truth. He evangelized and uh, established a tremendous work of apostolic Christianity in the island of Ireland. It remained in close connection with its Celtic brothers across Europe and into the East, and so it remained the center of Greek Sabbath-keeping Christianity long after Rome was forcing Latin upon Europe. In the town of Kells was found an ancient manuscript illustrating the magnificent high culture and high education of these men. 
their centers look something like this, a wall around a little community with a church in the center. These little communities were colleges, and many of them were established by Patrick. The Book of Kells illustrates something of the beautiful manuscripts that at one time were produced by these scores and scores of centers throughout Ireland and later Scotland and on the continent of Northern Europe. It shows a degree of skill that surpassed any other skill of its kind in all of the world at that time. The reason why Scotland and Ireland remained a bastion for truth is because the Celtic people were so powerful. Rome could not conquer Scotland, and so Hadrian built a wall across Britain and there placed troops to keep the Celtic or the Scotch, Scotch, Scottish people from coming into Britain again. The rulers of the Scotch people, the Scottish people, were the Druids. These people were highly educated and highly cultured. They had a center of education on the island of Iona. That island had influence over the people throughout Scotland. One of the graduates from Patrick schools of Ireland was a man by the name of Columba, an extremely gifted saint of God. He was from a wealthy family that owned land in Scotland. He made his way back to the land of his birth, and there putting aside the opportunity for wealth, he became a missionary for God. In the center, just below the center of this picture, you'll see uh, the word Iona. Iona was a little island out among the inner Hebrides. There in this rough northern cold sea, Columba decided to establish his school. It was a school patterned after the Old Testament school of the prophets. Here the young people would learn trades. They would learn how to till the soil, grow their own food. They would also learn the biblical languages. And after 18 years of disciplined study, these young men could go out to the nations of the world and establish schools. They entered almost every country of Europe and established many colleges and centers, although the history of this has largely been lost. Columba and Patrick became such well-known names in the culture of the islands that the Roman church, when they came in and forced their control over these centers in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th century, had to saint these men and create legends and fairy tales about them so the people would think in time, after generations had passed, that Columba and Patrick had been Roman Catholics. If you look up to the left side of this map, you'll see the blue lines. These blue lines represent the movement of Columbus and Patrick schools as they went across Europe. It was in the 6th century that the Roman Catholic Church sent a man by the name of Augustine into Britain. Here he could not convert the British church over to the Catholic faith. So he promised them that they would suffer the consequences of failure to acknowledge the Pope of Rome. But in spite of all that he could do in converting the pagans and using them to butcher and harass the Sabbath-keeping Christians, they continued strong for another 200 years. If you look at this map, which represents the years 600 to 1000 A.D., Notice in the upper left-hand corner that Ireland is still completely blue. Scotland is still completely blue, indicating that it's still strongly the Irish-Scottish Church, the Sabbath-keeping Celts. But also notice to the left side of the map of Britain, you'll find an area that's all blue as well. That land was the land of Wales. You see, the Roman Church worked with the pagans that were coming into the country, the Anglo-Saxons and the Danes and the Norsemen, and used them to systematically destroy the Celtic Sabbath-keeping Christians. But one area of Britain remained faithful, and that area was the area of Wales. For years it was protected by a powerful king, a king by the name of King Arthur. Yes, King Arthur was a Sabbath keeper, and beside him was a pastor of the Celtic Church. Although the Roman Church has tried desperately to put the real legend, uh, the real history of King Arthur into mystical legend, the facts of history bring out that the Welsh people maintain the Sabbath-keeping truth.
and that every inch of that land that was won by the Roman Catholic Church was won only through terrible bloody battles as these people wanted to preserve the truth for later generations. In the third century, Vigilantius decided not to follow the allegorizing paganized Christianity that was coming into Rome and Alexandria, Egypt and in Palestine. He broke free from it and entering into the ancient valleys of northern Italy and southern France, there he established a vast organization of missionary work among the Latin people who had a copy of the received text called the Itala Bible or the early Latin Bible, not the Vulgate, which is a corrupt translation. These people, called the people of the valleys, or the Valdenses, continued their missionary work throughout Europe for many, many, many years. They became one of the strongest branches of the church of the wilderness. Later, a man by the name of Columbanus made his way from the schools of Patrick and Columba across Europe to Bobbio in northern Italy. If you follow the blue lines down across the Frankish kingdom, you see the name of Columba, and later it ends up in a town called Bobbio in the lower right-hand corner of the map. This little town was in the high reaches of a valley called Engragna. It was almost inaccessible there, and here he established his school. He was an enemy number one of the Roman Catholic Church, and they longed to destroy him. This is the valley of Torre Belice in the Waldensi Valleys. Of Bobbio, it is written, here the nucleus of what was to be the most celebrated library in Italy was formed by the manuscripts which Columban had brought from Ireland and the treaties of which he himself was the author. The fame of Bobbio reached the shores of Ireland and the memory of Columban was dear to the hearts of his countrymen. A 10th century catalog published by Muratori shows that at that period, every branch of knowledge, divine and human, was represented in this library. Bobbio became such an evangelical training center that later the Roman Catholic Church followed the same procedure with Columbanus as, he, as she did with Patrick and Columba. She finally claimed him as one of her own. She sainted him. Columbanus did not live much more than a year after he had finished the work at Bobbio. Though there was widespread grief at his impending death, there were no regrets in his own heart. He could look back on the more than 30 years of arduous labors and recognize that he had made an indelible impress upon the Franks, Germans, Suevi, Swabians, Swiss, and Lombards. He willingly laid down the work for which God had appointed him. He finished his work in 615, being at that time some 72 years of age. His body was Beneath, was buried beneath the altar of the church, and to this day his remains are kept in the crypt of the church at Bobbio. About 25 extant manuscripts are purported to be his writings. We read that in the 6th century that throughout the entire world the Sabbath was the day of worship. For although almost all the churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, refuse to do this. Ambrose was a celebrated bishop of Milan. Milan was a land that had never conceded to Rome. Ambrose, a celebrated bishop of Milan, said that when he was in Milan, he observed Saturday, but when in Rome, observed Sunday. This gave rise to the proverb, when you are in Rome, do as the Romans do. It wasn't for years later that Rome forced, through the force of arms of Milan and Lombardy, to accept the Roman Catholic Church. In Eastern Europe, Pope Nicholas I in the ninth century sent the ruling prince of Bulgaria a long document saying in it that one is to cease from work on Sunday but not on, Sabbath, on the Sabbath. The head of the Greek church offended at the interference of the papacy declared the pope excommunicated. The battle went on for years. We read from the Council of Frau, Italy, 791. We command all Christians to observe the Lord's Day, to be held not in honor of the past Sabbath, but on account of that holy night of the first of the week called the Lord's Day. When speaking of that Sabbath with the Jews observed, the last day of the week, and which also our peasants observe, and so on. So even in the 
8th century and probably early 9th century, many of the peasants in Rome itself were still keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath as the old Latin church did before the apostasy of Rome. And yet Rome gained tremendous power and prestige as a state religion at the time of Justinian. Justinian conquered the Sabbath-keeping vandals and conquered areas of Europe that had been lost because of previous wars. Justinian also gave special privileges to the Bishop of Rome and announced in 538 that he was the Bishop of the whole Christian world. The armies of Rome stood behind Justinian and at that time he made a decree that all Christians within the empire had only three months to convert to the Roman Catholic faith. This caused a tremendous migration out of the Roman world. Many families were ruthlessly slaughtered and their belongings stolen from them. It was in 538 then that the church disappeared into the mists of the wilderness and continued to worship the truth in remote areas of the world. The Roman church tried desperately to wipe out all records of the Sabbath-keeping Christians, just as the pagan Egyptian kings, upon coming to the throne, tried to wipe out the names of all the other kings and histories of the past, to make it appear that he alone was the sole king. Often they falsified the lengths of the time that they were the king and created fantastically long periods of rulership. The same was done in Assyria and other areas of the world. Truly the Roman church was pagan and it was going to destroy everything that stood in its way. It was Innocent III in the 12th century that established the terrible Inquisition that butchered and tortured anyone that disagreed with Rome for hundreds of years. That was the beginning of the end for those areas that had continued faithfully to keep the truth alive in Europe. One of the greatest means of destroying the church in the wilderness was the rising of a man by the name of Tamerlan, a fanatical Muslim he destroyed Christians in the East by the millions. He destroyed their churches and their lands. And it was almost impossible to regain uh, their holdings after this slaughter took place, except that through the Spirit of God they could. But one thing happened that ensured the death of the church in the wilderness in the East, and that was the coming of the Jesuits with the armadas of Portugal and Spain. As the countries that traded with them from India all the way through China and to the east opened up their doors to the Jesuit priests, they allowed the Inquisition to be set up there and then mass slaughter and persecution and death came to the simple, humble, primitive Christian church that kept the Sabbath, that taught that man should obey the law of God by faith and had the ancient received text or the King James Bible. These people paid for it with their lives. They tried to preserve the faith for you and I today. One of the most magnificent records of history is that of the Waldensian Christians. They're, they had been given many names by the Roman Church, Passaginians because they were the people of the, passage of the passages of the mountains, or they were called the Judaizers because they kept the Sabbath. They were all called, also called the Insabati or Sabati or in Sabatani, because they kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. They're all ca also called the Vadois, or the Waldenses, the peoples of the valley. The Waldenses were to be found in every single country of Europe in spite of the Roman Catholic persecution. The heart of their religion was the Holy Bible, the received text, the King James Bible. They were known for their knowledge of agriculture in any valley or country that hosted the Waldenses had the blessing of their knowledge of the soil. The mountainsides throughout their valleys are terraced with good water system and excellent soil. One of the most important things to the Waldenses was the education of their children. They believed that the preservation of truth was in the preservation of the character of Christ in their children, the knowledge of the Bible. From the early ages, these children not only had to work hard, but they also had to memorize scripture. In the emergencies of the persecution of their world, at times they had to assemble all the children. Because these children had memorized portions of the Bible, they could line the children up, and the children would be able to recite the Bible, the entire Bible, by beginning at one child and going around the circle of these children's Bible societies. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful today if we followed the counsel of the Spirit of God and looked to the Waldenses as a source of how our children should be educated, how we should carry out our economy and our missionary work? The children that were raised with such character and strength often were able to be kidnapped from their parents and maintain the faith in spite of the persecution. Some of these children were sent off to other schools and universities and there they spread the truth in other lands. At the heart of the Waldensian Valleys is a place called the Pra del Tor at the head of the or at the end of the Valley of Angragna. Here in this almost inaccessible area, the barbs or the pastors of the Waldensian church were educated. The term barb means uncle and shows the close family relationship between the pastor and the people of those valleys. These men were highly educated. They studied for many years. And then before they could be ordained, they had to go out and have actual experience in the field. A young pastoral student would go with an experienced pastor and there they would do their missionary work. Often they would pose as itinerant merchant men. They would aim at the wealthy educated classes, believing that once these were converted they would influence many others. They would spread their wares before these people and among their wares they would have pages copied from the Bible. Upon reading these to these people, many of these people took their stand for the primitive Christian truth. We read that the Waldenses, as they were ancient, were also numerous. Vignier, from other historians, gives a high idea of their populousness. The Waldenses, says the author, multiplied wonderfully in France, as well as other countries of Christendom. They had many patrons in Germany, France, Italy, and especially in Lombardy, notwithstanding the papal exertions for their extirpation. This sect, says Nangus, was infinite in number, appeared, says Renarius, in nearly every country, multiplied, says Sanderus, through all the lands, infected, says Caesarius, a thousand cities, and spread their contagion, says uh, Siconius, through almost the whole Latin world. Scarcely any region, says Gretzer, remained free and untainted from this pestilence. The Waldensians, says Popliner, spread not only through France, but also through nearly all the European coasts, and appeared in Gaul, Spain, England, Scotland, Italy, Germany, Bohemia, Saxony, Poland, and Lithuania. Matthew Paris represents this people as spread through Bulgaria, Croatia, Dalmatia, Spain, and Germany. Their number, according to Benedict, was prodigious in France, England, Piedmont, Sicily, Calabria, Poland, Bohemia, Saxony, Saxony, Pomerania, Germany, Livonia, Sarmathia, Constantinople, Philadelphia, and Bulgaria certainly far vaster than we'd ever realized before. But unfortunately, many of their books were lost during the persecutions of the 17th century, and only those books and ancient documents sent to the libraries of Cambridge and Geneva by Pastor Lager were preserved. The papists took care after every persecution to destroy as much of the Waldensian literature as possible. Many of the barbs were learned men and well-versed in the languages of science of scripture. A knowledge of the Bible was a distinctive feature of the ancient as well as the modern Vaudois. The Roman church's main assault against the Vaudois as the flood of the waters of the dragon spread out across Europe was to create a false history concerning them. They taught that they, the Waldenses were named after this man, a Roman Catholic originally that wanted to start an order in the Catholic church called the Poor of Lions. He was called Waldo. And although he made contact with the Waldensians, Certainly their name was used for them long before he came into existence. But the Roman church also taught that these people met at night in black Sabbaths and there performed witchcraft rites. Many of the teachings that exist today of witchcraft were formed by the Catholic church in the Inquisition forcing false um, confessions out of people that were suffering underneath their hands. The slaughter continued for over 400 years, and by the 15th century there was largely silence over the valleys of the Waldenses. But God had intended that the light should not go out, but that the truth should be passed on to the generations that you and I live in today. These people suffered terribly. They never knew whether they'd see loved ones again. In one of the drawings of one of the caves of the Waldenses, we see a picture of uh, soldiers taking the women away. 
we see one of the pastors being grabbed roughly by a soldier to be put to a death, and the entire scene is being directed by a Roman Catholic priest. The children are being taken from the parents. This cave is found near Torre Pelice, north of the Piedmont Valley. Here, 400 Waldenses met with their children and worshiped God beneath the earth so that they could maintain their freedom to worship as the Spirit of God directed. There is not a valley of the Waldenses that did not have its martyrs, did not have its village where scores of people lost their lives. It took a hundred, or they say twenty, uh, of the papal soldiers to take one Waldenses because of God's protection throughout those years. By the 15th century, there was largely silence throughout the valleys as they had made many compromises and had lost the Sabbath day, as well as other of the ancient truths. But when they heard of the Great Reformation, they came together here at this stone in the valley of Chanfran and made a commitment to stand again for God. Because of this, terrible persecutions were directed against them, and many of them were exterminated, many of their valleys repopulated by the Catholics. The Vatican determined to stamp them out forever and gave them an ultimatum. It told them that they had to completely leave their teachings behind and accept the Catholic Church, all their children to be educated as Catholics, all their pastors to convert to Catholicism. This was too much for them to take, and they refused to cooperate. The result was that the last of the Waldenses were taken out of those mountains and put in a terrible dungeon in Torino, Italy. Here they were kept packed together as the slaves had been kept in the slave ships because of the diseases that broke out and the terrible uh, starvation that took place there, 14,000 of them went in, but only 5,000 of them crawled out. This was the end of the ancient history of the Waldensian people, or so the Roman Church thought. They came under tremendous pressure from the Reformation countries of Europe to release the Waldenses into the care of the Reformers. The Catholic Church agreed, and in the dead of winter, they forced a death march of these people through the snowy Alps. These people who were sick, who didn't have enough clothes, largely barefooted, they sent them through these ice-cold mountains through a storm. 3,000 of them arrived in Geneva. And there's a marvelous history of one of the faithful pastors who longed to go back and to regain his valleys. After repeated quests, questions, and efforts to gather men, requests of the Reformation uh, countries to aid him, Enrico Arnaud, determined to make his way back into the valleys, with the Bible in his belt and a sword in his hand, he went forward to regain their ancient home. But what about the Waldenses today? They have largely lost the knowledge of truth. They claim an ancient history, but they've organically united with the Methodist Church, and they herald this Pope, the one who is determined to implement Vatican II as the great man of peace. They assume that the Catholic Church has changed, and thus Waldensianism is only a memory today. You see, God has raised you and I up to take up the banner that was lost by the Waldenses and the Church of the Wilderness to reestablish the paths to dwell in, to show the world that the Sabbath-keeping Christians of antiquity are God's true people in all ages and will be throughout all eternity. We read that Gregory Bishop, by the grace of God to his well-beloved sons of Rome and citizens, it has come to me that certain men of perverse spirit have disseminated among you things depraved and opposed to the holy faith, so that they forbid anything to be done on the day of the Sabbath. What shall I call them except preachers of Antichrist? They would call Sabbath keepers Antichrist. Pope Gregory again declared that when Antichrist should come, he would keep Saturday as a Sabbath. The papacy still believes these things. We find that they are still as ruthless as they were in the past. When they took over uh, Croatia, 
they slaughtered the Serbians priests dressed up as soldiers and butchered those peoples when the Catholic Church could get away with it. They're the same power that they are today and the scenes of the past, friends, are going to be more than rivaled when Protestantism and Catholicism unite to persecute the primitive church, the Sabbath keepers, those who obey God's commandments. I once sat in this cave in the woods to anticipate what it would be like when we again, someday very, very soon, have to face the kind of persecution that our forefathers faced. Jesus is calling the church out of the wilderness today. Jesus is calling upon you and I as Sabbath-keeping Christians to prepare for the final wrath of the dragon. We're told that that precious church will face the wrath of Satan, those who keep God's commandments and have the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. We are a remnant of this history. We are the last ones. We are the depositories of God's sacred truth. And the responsibility lies with us to work together to present these precious teachings of the three angels' message to the world. You've got to study like you've never studied before. You've got to know that Bible as our forefathers knew it and pray for opportunities to begin missionary work for others. We ask that you'll join us in determining that you will take a stand as our forefathers did and finish up this precious work. Our heritage as Adventists is a wonderful thing. I'm proud to be a Sabbath keeper, and I'm proud to be a member of the Remnant Church. I've committed my life to presenting the Three Angels' message in whatever way I can. I make a living by painting biblical scenes, and prayerfully we're building up a small audiovisual center here. The first major project that we want to embark upon is a project to bring to life on video the ancient history of Sabbath keeping from the time of the Apostles and to prove that the Seventh-day Adventist faith is the oldest Christian religion on earth. You know, at one time in our church history, our pioneers understood this history of the Sabbath. J. N. Andrews wrote a book called The History of the Sabbath that went through five editions. It's a magnificent volume. And it describes Sabbath keeping from apostolic times taking place in every part of the world. In 1944, another wonderful book came out. It was called Facts of Faith. It, too, documents Sabbath keeping and the Great War with Roman Catholicism. There were other scholars as well, but nothing could match the book that came out in 1944, Truth Triumphant, written by B.G. Wilkinson. He was a dean of theology at Washington Missionary College. This man traveled the world. He was a scholar. He had a photographic mind. He retained things that many people knew nothing about, and he was far ahead of his time. This scholarly work, well documented, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Sabbath keeping has existed in every age and in most of the countries of the earth down to the present day, still scattered groups keeping the Sabbath. We find in Ethiopia there are Sabbath keepers there that have been keeping it from the time of Christ in Armenia and other parts of the world. One of the branches of the Sabbath keeping Christian families was that of the Celtic Church. In 1963, Leslie Harding produced his doctrinal thesis on this subject. It was called Beliefs and Practices of the Celtic Church in Britain. This was the only man to ever do a study of the beliefs and practices, and he proves that these people held the same doctrine as we do on righteousness by faith all the way down to the 8th and the ninth centuries. We have a tremendous heritage. There's plenty of information here available, but today it's very hard to find good uh, missionary books on this subject. There is a good volume available for Adventists to read. It's called The Sabbath in Scripture and History, published in 1982. This volume, a result of a number of our scholars putting their minds together, is very scholarly and very difficult for the average person to read. Certainly, it wouldn't be usable as a missionary book. I believe that a way of getting this message 
before the masses is through a documentary video. We plan to leave in the latter part of June 1987 to travel all over the world. It'll take us over four months to do that, to go to the old centers of Sabbath keeping, video them and photograph them, and put together a hard-hitting, rapid-moving documentary that will take about two hours. It wa we want something that'll be of such a quality and prove it so thoroughly that you would feel comfortable in giving it to a friend, a relative, a man who's a thinker, an educator, a doctor. And I believe that when we're done with this, they will believe that the Seventh-day Sabbath is the only Sabbath of Scripture and history, and that Sunday's a fraud. You see, the Sunday movement is coming rapidly, and we have very little to face it with. And I believe that this would be a tool that will win thousands of people. But my team cannot do this alone. We need your help. We have committed our lives to this project, and God has systematically been building up a small video studio here. But we need funds. We need funds for this trip to gather as much material as we possibly can. How much we gather and the quality of this production depends upon all of us working together as laymen. I urge you to send a financial donation to aid this project as soon as possible. For a tax-deductible receipt, send your check to LLT Productions, P.O. Box 205, Angwin, California, 94508.